Welcome to another episode of Before You Kill Yourself with your host, Leo Flowers. I am Leo Flowers. Today's guest is Zainab Johnson. I was super excited to have her on. She's a comedian, actress, and writer who is quickly being propelled as one of the most unique and engaging performers on stage and screen. Zainab's comedy is based on her unique point of view, which was shaped growing up in Harlem as one of 13, not 12, not 10, not six, but 13 siblings in a Muslim family. We got a sitcom. I, I can hear it. I can, I can feel it. It's right around the corner for you, Zainab. Uh, after getting a degree in math and taking a job as a teacher, she quickly learned that she had a different calling. She's been called Variety's top 10, one of the top 10 comics to watch in 2019. She is currently a series regular on the new Amazon original series called Upload with from uh, Greg Daniels and is currently the host for Netflix's show 100 Humans. Wait, welcome, Zainab Johnson. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Leo. I'm excited to chat. Um, 13 kids. That's uh, a lot of kids, a lot of emotions, not a lot of space. Was there was there a lot of shoving, a lot of uh, theft or was it was it choreographed? Was it a beautiful choreography of family function? A whole lot of shoving, a whole lot of thievery, a whole lot of uh, it's, it's like you're in the wild. It's it's you're in the wild, although you're in your apartment with your family, you're still in the wild. And, and so do you still feel like that? To You know, like I, I, I imagine, you know, when people get out of prison, they, they sit at the table with their elbows on the table because they're afraid of. Uh, you know, the other wild animals getting what they have. Do you feel that in in business, in relationships, in life? Or are you just like, oh, I got space now, I'm cool? No, I actually don't feel like that at all. And in business and, you know, personal relationships, I think it actually serves me to have come from that type of environment because, I can easily adapt to most other environments. I attract in friends and romantic situations, I attract only children. And I think it's because they are very needy and I know what it is to be around people who are needy and I know what it is to not be, um, to not have your needs met all the time. You know, I know what it is to come fifth because I'm the fifth child. So I know what it is to come fifth or to be last or whatever, you know? So I think it actually services me. And I mean, you know, my biggest thing when I was growing up, I used to like protect the leftovers. That was like, oh, that was like a delicacy. For me. Like, oh my God, that was a luxury to like get something, save it, go to it later and it still be there. That almost never happens. So now I'm in the position where I got to throw stuff out because there's no one here to take it from me. Wow. All right. So in every family dynamic, I watched the show succession on HBO. Yes. And it's one of my favorite shows. And it was a New York times article that broke down because it's, it's four kids vying to be the successor of a, of a, a major of a fortune 500 company. And they broke down each one of the kids by their response to uh, fear. So one kid is fight, one kid is flight, one is fawn, and then the other is, uh, I forget what the fourth F is. And so when you look at your your family, right? You're the fifth kid. Wh what were you the were you the pleaser? Were you the fighter? Were you the like personality wise? How did you fit into that family dynamic? I think that I have and always, I think that I am and have have always been the person that is most interested in the solution, the person that is most interested in what is fair, the person that is most interested in harmony. Because when when things are harmonious, it's, it's easy for everybody, right? Um, and so I don't think that I'm, I've been a pleaser, but I'm not not a pleaser. I don't think that I've been the fighter, 
but I'm not not a fighter. It's like I adapt to whatever is necessary in the moment. But like I definitely have siblings that are the pleaser all the time. I have siblings that are the fighters all the time. And I think that I have the the uh, skill of adaptability. You know, and it's like, so what's needed in this specific moment? I think I also have the skill of like logic. You know, I think that's always been my thing. Like what's going to best service me and all of us in this moment? That's what I'm going to go for. If that means I got to knock you down, then I'm going to knock you down. If that means I got to kiss your ass, then I'm going to kiss your ass. That means I got to walk away, then I'm going to walk away. You know, it's funny that you bring that up because when I think of you, I was I was thinking about you before this podcast and and I was like, when I'm around you, I feel held by you. Really? What does that mean? Meaning that you have a uh, a, a, there's something nurturing about you. Um, And it's it's something like when you when you come into the room, I'm like, okay, we good. Like, I don't know, what's, whatever happens, we good. We good. Like, Zainab got this. Like, she's ahead of it. She, she, she can handle this. And I feel like I can handle whatever walks in the room because you're there. So I under, when you said you attract only children, I, I get that because I, only children really need that care, that nurturance, that attention. And you have a way of making people feel safe and secure. But also, like you said, you also have a way of setting boundaries of like, there's a line. I'm like, all right, don't, 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 but don't cross the line though. Like she'll, she'll tuck you in and read you a bedtime story, but, um, you know, don't, don't, don't get too crazy. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting that you say that because I do think that I have a good way of like, um, without having to aggressively do it, but people know my boundaries, right? Like it's an energy thing. But I think in terms of like environment and safety, I think that I'm always in a room operating to make sure that I'm safe. And so if I'm safe, then just by default, everybody else is safe. Does that make sense? Say say more to that because so many people struggle with feeling safe. So say is it is it how you position yourself? Um, and talk us to that that line of thinking of if I'm safe, everybody else is safe. Well, like let's take our profession for instance, right? It's like a lot of comics may walk into a situation and really not be okay with it. If I'm not okay with it, I actually don't care that everybody else is not okay with it. My goal is to get it to a place where I can be okay with it. And since I've gotten it to a place where I can be okay with it, that's a solution for everybody. Does that make sense? So like part of my get, part of me giving almost comes from a very selfish place. It's like, well, I have to take care of me. I'm used to doing that. Like I said, it was the wild. So it's like if I'm taking care of me and by taking care of me means this entire environment is taken care of. Oh, then we're all taken care. Oh, so of course you feel taken care of because I chose to take care of me. Does that make sense? (laughs) You know what? It makes sense because I think about that in my relationship. Uh, d- just to bring it to to a smaller picture in relationships, a lot of us are afraid to be selfish or to take care of ourselves, which is different than being selfish, but to take care of ourselves because we think we're taking away from the people around us, right? But really what it does, it does a few things. One is people watch how we take care of ourselves. And the better we, and the more effective we are at doing that, the more people start to mirror that kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. That's one, right? Mm -hmm. Two is when we take care of ourselves, there's a calmness that comes from, I've taken care of myself. I've, I, you know, I did, I did yoga, I meditate. I went to a sauna, a journal, uh, I practiced, uh, you know, like I'm prepared. I feel activated. I'm engaged. I'm present. I'm not, I'm Mm -hmm. not in the past or the, or in the future. I'm here right now. 
And people pick up on that. And so I think about it like when I'm on a plane and there's turbulence and some people freak out, I look at the I look at the flight attendants. If they mm. cool, I'm cool. If they freak out and they they scramble into the seat to put the seatbelt on, they put a helmet on and and uh, you know they I see them texting <laughs> frivolously. I'm like, oh, we going down. Like it's it's a wrap. <laughs> but I, I look at the flight attendants to tell me, you know, because they've flown a thousand, they they flown more flights than anybody, so they know what's normal, what's not normal. Right. And so going Mm -hmm. back to you, if I'm safe, I I, then I'm exuding an energy of safety, of calmness. So, yeah, everything must be good. Yeah. Is there is there a way that is there a process you have in the morning of kind of grounding yourself, feeling safe before you even step out into the public and being in a room full of comics or friends or family um i think that i and like my morning routine recently has changed i've started listening to classical music first thing in the morning um i don't know there's like a certain rhythm to certain ones there's like a certain rhythm to it that just seems like you should be going like you should be moving you know um and but there's not there's no like it doesn't feel like any subliminals come through. Like when you listen to songs with lyrics and stuff like that, you know, you can feel like, oh, you're taking on what the person, the message in the song, you're taking on that energy. And I feel like classical music, it's new for me, but I feel like it's really, really helping me. But I think the first thing that I do when I wake up is, you know, I acknowledge God and I am very thankful that you know, I've, I've woken up to another day and I just set my intention, you know, and that doesn't, you know, every day isn't that successful, but most days are. It's like I set my intention to to be be active, you know, be active in every part of my existence. Um, and sometimes that means I have to write things down. Some things, sometimes that means I have to, you know, just keep running it in my mind. But, um, but, um, yeah, that's it's definitely starts with the mind first. And then I move like with intention. I go for runs. Leah, I'm not sure if you know that about me, but I get up in the morning and not every morning, but a good number of mornings throughout the week. And I go for a run. And that's always like that's always for me, like that's such a in my opinion, it's such a um a self-care act. It's so for me, it's not for weight loss, it's not for you know, it's just it's just for me, which is why I have to do it outside. I can't do it on a treadmill. And so because the first thing I do in a day is give something to myself, like I gift myself a, a long run like outside in the world. Anything after that that I have to give over, it's much easier because I've started my day gifting myself with something. And that goes back to the self-care, right? So you've gifted yourself and now you're able to be present for other people, which Mm -hmm. also allows you to be able to read the room and see, hey, does anybody else need anything? Mm -hmm. And I I think that's an important thing to note for for the listeners out there. We have so much to give to other people, but it's hard for us to recognize how to do that if we haven't given to ourselves first, if we haven't taken care of ourselves at some point and it, well, sometimes that might mean you have to get up a little earlier than everybody else. Some, you know, mm-hmm. some people still at home with 13 people in the house. So you, you got to find a space <laughs> in a bathroom, in a closet, wherever you can in a, in a, in a back seat, wherever you can find that space and, and make that for yourself. Um, I love that you go for a run in the morning. Do you listen to music or do you feel safe enough to have things playing in your ear or do you run without it? No, I definitely feel safe enough to have things playing in my ear. In Los Angeles, in New York, I don't run when the sun is not up. I can run as the sun is coming up or as the sun is going down, but I'm never running in pitch black. But the reason why I stipulate those two places, obviously I'm there most times, but I've spent the past few years, I've been spending time in Vancouver filming. And for some reason, I don't know what I feel about Vancouver, but I can go for a run in the pitch black. Like, 
I can wake up at three or four o'clock in the morning and go for a run. Oh, a car is coming to pick me up to take me to set at 5 a.m. I'll get up at 3.30 a.m. and go for a run in the complete dark, headphones on, music blasting. To the point where my hair, my key hair person on set gave me like a, um, like a, a, a sound thing that the moment I like activated, it, it's so piercing that it, it'll, it'll make someone stop whatever they're doing. It'll make animals like stay away from you. And so she's like, here, take this, put it on your keychain." And I've never had to use it, but like now I have it. Um, but yeah, I listen, when I run like here, I mostly podcast and people think that that's so weird. And I think it's because I'm one of 13. I feel safe when people talking. I feel much more safer with people when there's conversation than when there's music. Yeah, because music to me uh, can drown out what people are saying um, and yeah. any, any verbal threats where like in conversation, I can hear conversation, but music yeah. can drown out, you know, like what is that person saying over there? Cut, turn the music down. I need to, I need to hear mm -hmm. what's going on across the street. They, 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 they look, uh, they look threatening. They look ominous. I don't trust them at all. I think also too, when I listen to podcasts, podcasts feel very present to me, you know, like we're rarely listening to like a podcast from, I mean, they don't exist 20 years ago. They don't exist, you know, where music, I find myself like not really wanting to listen to old music because it makes me feel like I'm not present. And then new music, it can be a struggle to find, not, not because the music is not good. I don't want to be one of those people in their thirties. that's like, what are these kids doing? It's not that, but I, like I said, I set an intention. And so what I know that every single thing I take in, just like everything I eat, everything I drink, that informs me and that informs my life in a way that is so real. I can't really, you know, I can't really run. The first thing I hear in the morning can't be you like, you know, you know, I fucked a good, ate a good, I, I just can't, you know, like, oh, he broke my heart, y'all fucked them niggas up. I, I just, I cannot, it, I just cannot <laughs> start my day like that. It don't matter how great the beat is, I just cannot start my day like that. And so I find it podcast at the very least, I start my day with new information. It's a, there's something empowering about knowing what's going on in the world around you. And, and then it's something that could inform maybe your stand up or now you can have uh, a, a more dynamic conversation with people as you talk to them throughout your day. Uh, yeah. But you can't be spitting those lyrics to somebody uh, <laughs> at a 10 a.m zoom meeting or, or on set <laughs> or you wonder you know like a lot of a lot of pain lives in music in different sorts of ways and while a beat feels good you don't realize how much pain and trauma you're absorbing you know and i think that's that's not me trying to say don't listen to music but i mean that's something to really be aware of i was in i was at the cellar in new york the other day and I was just sitting there eating like after a show. And, you know, I don't, you've been, you, you perform at the cellar, right, Leo? And yeah. so, you know, they always have Charlie Chaplin playing on the loop, right? And this was a Saturday night, I believe. So they normally have like a band, you know, but instead they had um, music playing over the speakers and it was like oldies and it was all of these love songs, these like love songs from the 60s and the 70s. And I was wondering like why I was feeling so good. And then when I got back home, I realized it's because I said like to the point where even in good conversation, you know how good a conversation can be with a, with a, with a table full of comedians, you know? Um, it's like, but I just kept like leaving the conversation to like you know, like engage with the songs that we're playing. And it's because I, I realized like, oh my God, I love really hearing about people being so in love with them. Like, just like, uh, you know, just loving someone, you know, like that. It's like, that. it felt so good. There's a song by Lenny Williams called I uh, Love You. Listen, uh, that uh, was the uh, first, uh, yes. Come on. Yo, Leo, that was the song that was playing when I first, the, the first time I left the conversation and I left it, on that on that bridge where he's like, well, you ain't never been in love. I like, love I the way I've been in love. love. Come on, let's go. <laughs> I 
I'm like, let me tell them. You ain't, they ain't never been in love like you've been in love. And you know what's funny about that? Somebody might listen to this and be like, you know, like, oh, that's an old song. But it's like, I wasn't alive when that song came out. I wasn't, you know, like I, I had to look up who Lenny Williams was. I, I didn't even discover that song from my parents because my parents didn't listen to music like that in our house. So I grew up in a, in a really strict Muslim household. So we didn't even listen to music like that. I, I discovered that that song as a, a person in her early 20s. So that's a very late discovery, you know? Um, but let me just tell you, I, listen, you ain't never been in love like I've been in love. You ain't never felt the pain that I felt. It, it, when he said, I played my records until my record, my record player wouldn't play no more. What? <laughs> I, you know how many? <laughs> the record player wouldn't play no more? I felt all of that. And I was lucky enough to where uh, I, I grew up in the opposite household where my mom was playing the Sam Cooke, Otis mm. Redding, Barry White. And so that was a song I discovered. I remember... I was probably like 10, 11, and I must have played it like three, four. I was feeling it then. I was like, I don't know who or what this is, but I feel all of this. But they talked to you back in the day. You know, yeah. those, those old songs, they, they, they talked to you first. They ain't just go straight into the, the beat. They, it was like, you felt like, oh, yeah, like, all right, you've been through this. But you know what's crazy, Leo? I realize that they're talking now too. Like the other day, I listened, and I will get back. You know, I'm I'm sure I'm off on a tangent at this point. But the other day, I listened to a good portion of Summer Walker's album. She's a young woman, a uh, young black woman who is, you know, a really incredible artist. Um, and 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 I think what her fans really like about her is she really sings about her her life. You know, they I think they feel like it's all so personal, you know? Like, you know, remember we didn't start getting like personal with Beyonce until but that's why when we got lemonade, we was like, oh, what 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 I, like you know, like oh, oh, you letting us in? What 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 Jay did? What who who did what to who said what? Hold up, you know, so, um, so, so I listened to her, her, most of her album, new recent album. And on the first record, Cardi B is actually talking, but it's just that they say things that, like, I'm, it's like, it's a, it, it really, it so depends on how you do something. And so let's take Lenny Williams, for example, right? That's still a broken heart. Right, what he's singing about is a broken heart. Although it it feels so good, it feels so good to hear. We're not really focused on your broken heart. We focused on how much you loved this woman, right? So now what Cardi B is talking, and I'm not saying this is wrong, but it's just this is just to show that they're still talking on record. They just ain't really. I guess they're not hearing something that's appealing. They're not saying anything that's appealing to my ear. Like you really have to be. Uh... It really has to be more creative for it to hit. Like that's why you're going back to classical music, right? Where yeah, yeah. it's like it's not even about the words anymore. It's like I, it's just the, the the feel, the beat, the ambiance. Like I'm listening to more ambient music. Mm -hmm. Um even um nature sounds, like I'm playing that more now. Like I'm, yeah. I'm more into like the the background. Like I got too much going on in my head and and there's not much out there that can compete with what I'm thinking about. You know. Exactly, exactly. But you know, you got to be careful with the classical music because some of it is very suspenseful. So I was in here like making a salad the other day, and then the music was like, dun, 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 dun. and I felt like I was like, well, what, 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 what who, who, who was behind the shadows? What? <laughs> uh, see, that's you're right because the only thing I don't like about classical music is it, it'll be real low for a good three, four minutes, and you'll forget the song is playing. And then all of a sudden, boom, boom, you're like, what? Did somebody break in the house? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so have you figured out what for Vancouver makes you feel safe or you just like? Well, I do also want to point out that I did live in like a posh area of Vancouver. So somebody could hear this and be like, oh, girl, where was you? Because, you know, they robbing, they robbing people on eighth. I don't know. Um, but um, I, I don't, part of it was, and this is, this makes no sense, but this was my psyche. Um, Vancouver has so many 
buildings. Um, so even when the city is dark, it still feels lit up, kind of like New York City. But it's obviously a very different, that New York City is a beast, you know? Um, in Vancouver, it just isn't. Like you said, there's a certain calmness to the city that, that you, especially for me coming from like a New York or LA, it's like you can't, it hits you like a, it, it, it wraps around you like a blanket, you know? Um, and, I, and I would run, I would run like uh, in the places where if somebody was going to get you, that's where they get you. I would be running around the water and you know what I'm saying? Running around the seawall. When it would when it would be dark and rainy, that would be the most peaceful time for me. I would feel like I would feel like I have this entire beautiful thing in nature all to myself. And then I would have these crazy thoughts like, and it's too cold for a killer to be out. Ain't nobody trying to kill in this weather. And, the, <laughs> and you know, Vancouver ain't even that cold, but it's like, it's cold enough where if you running at four o'clock in the morning, I'm like, ain't nobody really trying to, you know what I'm saying? Do too much in this. It's snowing. It's, it's, a, you know, like just go up to trying your, to risk up, pneumonia. Yeah. yeah. Ain't nobody trying to do this. You know, <laughs> you want to throw me off the seawall. It's like, I'm going to hit some rocks. Then you're going to have to come down and make sure that I'm dead. Cause it's like the water ain't just right there. It's a, do you get what I'm saying? Like, I think about all of the things, the things that scare me the most when I'm running are animals. Like I'm never thinking about humans and where, where, when I'm in the States, I'm always thinking about human beings. But when I was in Vancouver and this is not at all, a, you know, it is a comparison, but it's not a better or worse. But for some reason, when I'm there, I'm never really thinking about people. I'm always thinking about like, oh, man, they said they said that the uh, they said that the mountain lions was they said that, the you know, that the what is it called? Not hyenas, um, wolves, foxes, coyotes, we have wolves, coyotes have been like attacking humans, you know, and so, which I, which I could understand why animals might get, because it's like, we just lived in a pandemic where people were inside. And so do you get what I'm saying? It kind of changes the landscape for them too. So I imagine it, the, the, they hungry. And so they, do you get what I'm saying? So I get all of that, but that's the thing that kind of uh, plays on my psyche more than, you know, like a man, you know, a murderer. I'm like, dang, if these wolves get me, that's, that ain't the story I want told. What steps are you taking to feel financially safe? Yeah, so I have had jobs. I had a babysitting job when I was younger. I think my first official job was when I was 16. I worked at The Gap. Um, and But I haven't had a lot of jobs, but I've always been a passion, um, a passion follower. And I think where that served me is it's always generated money because I'm following a passion. And I hate to sound cliche, but like when I really do look back, I'm like, yeah, you kind of do what you want. And it's you, you, you followed your mind and it services you, you know, but I'm no idiot. I will go get a bill's got to be paid. Oh, I will go get a job, you know? So I think the past, um, probably four years of my life, probably, yeah, like in 2017 is when I actually started managing my money. Um, and by that, meaning knowing how much is coming in, how much is going out, and like what I'm trying to do and what those numbers need to look like if I'm trying to do what I'm trying to do. Then I realized in managing money, you start to hoard money. Because when you grow up poor, you you hold you hoard it. And I'm not trying to say I'm not frugal at all. Actually, I'm a spender, which is why I know I got to make a lot of money because I'm a, I'm a spender. But I was not. I was like holding, like just putting money in the bank, money in the bank, money in the bank, and it's not growing at all. It's sitting there. And so this was the first year that I started getting into the education of growing money. Now I'm like, you know, I have, you know, I've been working with a financial advisor. Like I have stocks and things. I play with my own little stuff on Robin Hood. Right now I'm really trying to get into understanding like the cryptocurrencies and, you know, life insurance as an investment versus like, a, you know what I'm saying? Like all of those different things. Um, 
passive income, like all of those things like I, that, like I'm just, I am in that mode right now. And I am at the very, the beginning, like I am novice. And I really, it's like my financial advisor, he's like, why you got this? This is worse than not having money. Just having this, this freaking load of money, just sitting here getting no one, like not even getting interest, like not you getting, you getting two cent on however many, you know, I don't want to put the number out there, but it's just like, like, what are you doing? You know, at least buy yourself a car. I mean, I got a car, but it's like, at least just spend it. So, and it's like, well, no, I'm, I'm actually done with that. I'm actually done with like trying to, you know, retail therapy myself. I'm done with that. That, that was, that was, uh, corrected that edu- that was corrected in the man in learning how to manage money, you know. Um, so I'm I'm at the very beginning of like, all right, this is what we do to this is how you grow money, and this is this is the risk, and this is the potential reward, and this is the you know like so that's where I'm at. And that I I know you asked me about safety. Um, there's a certain part of me that uh, I'm working to change again, shift the perspective. And I know that this comes from a lack of financial education. I know that this is something that's prevalent in communities of color, you know, like, uh, so, so my house is really an asset to me. Right. But it's also a debt. And I was talking to my financial advisor and I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm gonna pay this house off in two years, which is a big fee. That's a, it's a lot of, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not a cheap house. And so he was like, Are, do you plan on living in that house forever? I was like, no, nah, I'll probably sell it in like three to five years, but, I, you know, get a bigger house somewhere. Like, and I say this, that sounds really like, I even know that me saying that so easily, it's like some people can't even fathom believing that they could do that. You get what I'm saying? Where me, I'm like, no, 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 I know. I don't know exactly how, but I know in three to five years, that's going to be the decision that's being made. Like, well, we got to get a bigger house, you know? Um but for me, I see it as a debt. I don't want to owe nobody because owing somebody makes me feel like that's my way back to the poor house. And so I'm like, oh, I got to pay off this debt. How much, how much do I owe you? I don't care. I don't, no, no, no. It's the reason why I like, like using an American Express because it's like you got to pay that joint off. It ain't no, it ain't no minimum payment. <laughs> it's, oh, oh, you spent 15000 Run us our 15000 right now. <laughs> no, we're not accepting $49. <laughs> Run us our whole $50,000. you right. Let me give you this $15,000. <laughs> but debt to me, I don't, you know, everybody, ev- everybody operates off of debt. All the most successful people, that's what they do. They accumulate. They're moving money around. They're, it's credit, credit, credit. That's really what debt, it's like you either see you either see something as credit or you see it as debt, right? And I think that when you come from a place of not having both in the tangible sense and not the understanding and education of it, you feel like, oh, debt is bad, debt is bad, debt is bad. Um, and so I am also, and, and in that instance, in that instance, I do feel very unsafe financially. And so I, I understand that though, I'm aware of that. And so I'm working to shift my perspective. I love that. Yeah, I, I bring that up because um, our feeling of safety is, you know, context dependent and and based off our experiences. And as you shared, like, you know, you had a different experience growing up. And so your idea of financial safety feels different for someone else who grew up in a different environment, for for someone who grew up like in, in a one percent household, in a very wealthy household. They, they would feel very comfortable carrying around a lot of debt and, and owing mm-hmm. millions on houses, um, as you said, a lot of people do. But for somebody who's never had that and, and doesn't understand that there are different types of debt, just like there's different types of fat. There's there are your good fats, your bad fats, your good you know, ways of taking in sugar and your, you know, everything mm-hmm. has, a, has a flip side. And so the, the more we educate ourselves and even emotions, you know, um, there's so much talk about being like fearless and, uh, and you know, how to not be angry or whatever. But as artists, you know, we, our job is to take the emotions, the fear, the pain, the angst, the worry, the, the despair, or whatever that is, and channel it into our art, channel it into music, right? Mm-hmm. Because we, we're all going through that. So it's not about getting rid of it 
or hoping it never resurfaces, but it's like, what are you going to do with this feeling of, oh, I don't feel safe? Do I need mm -hmm. to move to Vancouver? Do I need to slowly learn about cryptocurrency? Uh, it's what are you going to do with that energy? Because it goes back to energy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely not going to move to Vancouver, but <laughs> I love working there. Love, love, love it. But um, I also be ready to come. Like when you first get to Vancouver, it's like, oh, yes, I forgot how freaking awesome Canada is. And then after three months, you'd be like, yo, especially three months in a, in a, in a pandemic. Like it's like our first season, I was able to go in and not come and go as I please, you know. But oof, during a pandemic where you just there, it's like, see, Canada, I mean, I mean, you know, she's great, but she gets on my nerves, <laughs> you know. But I found that in traveling, there are three length of stays, right? There are places that are perfect for three days, uh, like Vegas. Their mm -hmm. per places, most places are perfect for 10 days. And then you have places that, uh, perfect for three months so mm. it's either three days 10 days or three months and, and the reason why i say three months is if you're there for a month or six it's not enough to really feel like you're a part of the culture mm -hmm. if you have some place for three months you feel like i got vancouver i know vancouver me and vancouver mm -hmm. oh yeah those are my people 10 days is enough to to enjoy it to relax to decompress but uh but but three months is um if you're going to do an extended stay anywhere, do it for three months if you can, because that's when, yeah. you, that's when you pick up the language, the culture, the food, the, the layout and, and, and all of that. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what's your biggest challenge right now, Zainab? <clears throat> uh, what do you, my biggest challenge is, um, and I think this has been my challenge for a while maybe is, um, like removing self-doubt. When you say removing self-doubt, tell me more about that. You know, that little voice that we have in our head that refuses to be our cheerleader. Like that little voice in our head that is like, oh, okay, well, you got, well, are you sure? You sure you got that? You sure you're doing this? You sure you're good enough? You sure you're supposed to be here? I don't know. I don't know. It don't feel right. It don't feel right. Give me, a, you know, like that, that, that voice that's just constantly like making you second guess or making you feel inadequate. I think like the, the journey is like quieting that voice, you know, and sometimes that voice gets amplified by people in your life, you know, like that's a voice that when you're trying to quiet that voice, you can't really have nobody in your life that does anything to amplify that voice, you know, um, and so I think that that's like, that's a, that's a struggle for me. Not so much imposter syndrome. I would have said like maybe two years ago, I, I suffered from imposter syndrome, like wondering if I should be in a space. But now I'm feeling very much comfortable in most spaces that I'm in, um, especially when it comes to work. Um, but it's just like, it's just like, Okay, like, it, it, I don't know. It's just quieting. It's like, it, okay, so yeah, you comfortable in this space, but is this space going to be here forever? It's like, shut your ass up. <laughs> Dang, ho, you ain't no fun. <laughs> do, do you notice um, that there are things that you do that amplify that you talked about the people you surround yourself with? Are there moments where you find that that voice is amplified versus times where it's quiet? And, and how do you quiet that voice? Um, I think that if, the, if my anxiety goes up for whatever reason, stress, uh, you know, it, the environment, uh, a circumstance, anything that kind of activates anxiety, that voice like lives in the anxious place, you know? Um, and I think the first thing I do to like quiet things like for a sense of it's like you got to breathe you know you got to like breathe um i understand now why i used to think that it was ridiculous like when you would watch movies and stuff like that and you see like pregnant women and like <laughs> but it's like oh yeah to push another human you know what i'm saying i'll be having to breathe like that 
just to get through a conversation sometimes. You know what I'm saying? So to, to push a person out of your lady parts, oh yeah, you better you, you better focus on the breath. You know? So first thing I do is like I try to at least take like a really deep breath. You know, you gotta make sure because like breath means it's like you're living and you you'll become really present if you if you if you take a deep breath and you and you focus on your breath. And then after that, it's about it's about recognizing like the facts. You know, a lot of times that voice is really they be focused on things that aren't real. So it's like, now let's focus on what's real. Okay, you're here in this moment. This person is front of, in front of you, or this is the news you just got, or this is the thing that you're doing. Everything is lined up for you to do. You have there's nothing for all you. All you have to do is just do. It. You get what I'm saying? Like I just focus on, like the real things. Like, okay, this is my ring light is set up. My computer's working. But you know what I'm saying? Like you just focus on the very real, tangible things. I love that. Focus on the breath. Focus on the tangible things. The things that are within your control and the things that you can see, touch, smell, hear, feel, mm -hmm. um, and, and then work from there. And sometimes you just gotta scream. I'm so sorry, Leo, I find myself not screaming, but I do this a lot. So forgive me for saying, <laughs> I do that like, uh, and it's like, it's cause I have to get it. It's like, <laughs> I just have to push it out. Cause it's so, and it sounds like, it sounds like a freaking exorcism. It does, but I have to get it out. It's like whatever, it doesn't feel good. It's a negative thought. It's a, <laughs> just get the, get out of me. Get the freak out of me. It's so hilarious. I did that, uh, I think last night or this morning. I don't remember which one, but in the last 24 hours, I definitely, um, they, they call it primal screams and primal yells. And, uh, and it's so funny because there are fewer and fewer places where you can do that and people won't look at you and call the cops on you and try to lock you up. So I got to go out into like the woods in the forest to mm -hmm. let out those screams and yells or in your car or in the shower. But yeah. there's definitely something cathartic about just yelling and screaming and, and pounding on your chest. And, and that was something that, you know, historically uh, uh, that we did every night, right? We, gather around a campfire, we feasted, we danced, and uh, it was just, it was a catharsis, a releasing of emotions to dance with others, to yell, to scream, and, 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 and get very primal. And, um, and now that we're working in these little cubicles and uh, we work spaces and everything has to be PC, uh, where we've, you know, everywhere is nice now, like a Vancouver, but we're a bit more caged and a little less mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. free to, to just yell and scream. Zainab, uh, plug all your things. Where, where can people find you? Uh, people can find me on all social media platforms at Zainab Johnson, Z-A-I-N-A-B. If you want to find me on TikTok, Tic Tac. On TikTok, it is the Zainab Johnson, T H E Z A I N A B J O H N S O N. Um, if you want to see my comedy, if you want to see my comedy live, I'll be performing an hour, hour set at the Improv in Hollywood, December 8th. Um, there's two shows, a 7.30 and a 9.45. I'll also be headlining Dr. Grins in Grand Rapids, Michigan, December 9th through the 11th, and that's five shows. So if you want to see me live, then come check me out at the show. There it is. And then last question, because I always imagine there's one person listening in who may be on the precipice of wanting to end their life. Before you kill yourself, what would you say to them, Zainab Johnson? You have no idea what tomorrow brings. You have no idea what the next moment brings. I love it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much, listeners, for being with us. Remember, this podcast is not a substitute for calling the 1-800-SUICIDE or 1-800-273-TALK or any of the other millions of phone numbers that are listed in the show notes. There's a Trevor Project there. If you're in Sri Lanka, if you're in Vancouver, if you are in the Ukraine, there are international suicide hotline phone numbers for you. You can talk, you can chat, you can text. Uh, there are online groups where you can get help. There's financial assistance. There are groups that will help you with that. Those are also listed in the show notes. You can go to thrivewithleo.com for one-on-one -on -one coaching with yours truly. Let's get to tomorrow together. Thank you so much, Zainab.
Thank you so much for having me, Leo. This is great.